Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Super real. Hey, I'm Julian Morgans, and you're listening to What It Was Like, the show that asks people who have lived through big, dramatic events what it was like. Hey, and welcome, and thanks for clicking on this episode. I know a title like My Husband, The Mass Shooter, Sounds like a hard listen. You could have chosen a show about optimizing your ice baths, but instead you've clicked on a show about a mass shooting. So, thanks. Look, naturally there's going to be a few tragic descriptions today, so just a trigger warning. But honestly, I don't want this to be some grueling listen where you get to the end and just feel bummed out. That's not the point of this. And also, it's not how today's guest feels about her own story. Because really, today's episode... It's about a relationship and about how our guest was able to move on via forgiveness. I'm talking with Marie Monville, who is a mother, an author, public speaker, and the former wife of a man who did something unspeakable. I recently came across her book, which I'd highly recommend. It's called One Light Still Shines, and it's this poignant account of Marie's experience. But here's the thing, all right? I'm not going to tell you what Marie's husband did, or, or not yet. And that's because I want you to find out what was happening at the same time as Marie did. And you'll hear today, Marie's experience unfolds with just just so many unknowns. She didn't know enough about what was happening to stop it. So I won't tell you yet what her husband did. Just suffice to say, it happened in 2006 and people died. And one last thing. I wanted to do this episode because it touches on something that I'm passionate about. And that's talking. And I mean real talking, not just that polite chit chat thing that people do in supermarkets. You know, they talk about the weather and how much things cost. I mean, real talking where people let their guard down. I'm passionate about that. I think this whole podcast is basically about that. And as a counterpoint, you'll hear that Marie's husband didn't talk, he didn't share, and he lived in a state of self inflicted emotional exile. And ultimately, not talking, not sharing, it became a death sentence. I mean, I've seen this amongst my own friends, and yeah, especially my male friends, this determination to appear successful at all times. You know, you ask some people about how they're doing, and they just automatically parrot back, not bad, how about yourself? It's like this script that we all have on how to exist. And and there's just, there's so many of us who are terrified of going off script especially in Australia. I think, I think here we have so many meaningless throwaway phrases to disguise our feelings. I've got friends who, if they briefly say something vulnerable, they'll then immediately follow it up with a throwaway comment like, anyway, first world problems, or anyway, swings and roundabouts. And, and then they just walk away with their cards pressed firmly to their chests, stoic and alone. And I don't like that. I don't like that it's a value in our culture. I think it's a value in American culture too, as you'll hear today. And I think that I think that life's just better when we're when we're honest, emotionally honest. And so I'm passionate about sharing this story of a tragic shooting because I think it illustrates the importance of talking. And also our guest today, Marie, she believes in talking too. It's what led her to start telling her story in the first place. So Thanks for clicking on this episode with the ominous headline. I promise I'll spare you the gratuitous violence and you'll hear some really interesting insights about why things like this happen. All right, let's get into it. Here is Marie Monville. Marie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. 
No, thanks for being here. So I want to start with your childhood. Tell me about your upbringing and what that was like. So I grew up in rural Lancaster County, so you can picture farmlands. I had more Amish neighbors than not. So there were many farms, you know, lots of rolling countryside. And in the summertime, you would see a lot of cornfields. It's just sort of, you know, that thing that it seems like is from a movie. Mm, sounds gorgeous. So, so your family, you weren't Amish, but you were surrounded by like an Amish community. Yes, absolutely. I was not Amish. Um, you know, I think that's a general question people ask quite frequently. They just kind of assume that if you live in an Amish community, then you are Amish. But, um, you know, I had neighbors that were not Amish as well. So there was a respect for one another an appreciation for what each, you know, part of the community brought to that place. But it wasn't this place where you blended and mixed all the time. All right. So you got married uh, fairly young. Mm -hmm. So this was to Charlie. Could yes. you tell me about how you guys met? Yeah. Yeah, we actually met at church. Uh, we were both very shy, very reserved. And his grandmother knew that he liked me. And I, I think she kind of told him, you know, if you don't ask Marie out, she was going to get involved and do it take care of that for him. Uh, but we started dating when I was in high school and yeah, I got married afterward. Okay. Can you give me an example of, of a moment that Charlie did something for you or for someone else that you thought, yeah, this, this, this is the right guy. I'd like to marry this guy. You know, I don't know that it was just this one moment, but I think it was kind of, you know, an unfolding, um, a, just a reinforcement of seeing the way he cared about me, the way he cared about my family. Um, he would help my dad with things when he'd come over projects or just was interested in things that my dad was talking about. And then kind of seeing the way that he was such a caretaker of others and compassionate and quiet. I just thought, you know, this man has the qualities that are important to me and meaningful, uh, things that you can build a life with together, things that are going to last the test of time. Mm hmm and and did you love him? I did. You know, I did love him and I I loved the future that we talked about and the life that we wanted to create together. We found out in our first year of marriage that we were going to have a baby and I thought, well this is wonderful, but we started to experience complications to the pregnancy around 20 weeks and our daughter was born premature at just 26 weeks of pregnancy and she mm -hmm. died 20 minutes after she was born. And so for me it was this place of thinking how how am I supposed to get through life like this? And I remember feeling so devastated by that loss. You know, and somebody said to me, well, don't let yourself get depressed. And I'm thinking, how are you supposed to not be depressed about this? Um, mm. You know, it just was such such a hard season um, and a place where for me, it was this time of really leaning into my faith and leaning into my relationship with God and developing this conversation with him. Okay. So yeah. I guess... After you miscarried, after after you lost your child, your mm -hmm. faith really helped you to get through this season. This season, did, as you yeah. say, and I, I yeah. like that word. The thinking of thinking of life's turns as seasons. I think that's nice. But but how did Charlie respond? You know, how did he work through that process? Mm -hmm. You know, he he went back to work. Um, he did all the things that it seems like a man's supposed to do, just kind of pick up where he left off and keep going and try to be there to comfort me. Um, and, and by you know, from the outside looking in, it looked like he was doing pretty well. And there, there would be times that I could tell that he was struggling. And sometimes I would say to him, you know, why don't you talk to somebody about it? But he, he always said the same thing to me, you know, there no guys talk about their problems. Nobody talks about their problems to me, so I'm not going to talk about my problems with somebody else. And it, it really seemed like he had a handle on things. I think this is a really important detail. You know, the way that men feel as though they should be stoic mm -hmm. when they're struggling. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I really want to just spend a bit of time unpacking this. Oh, absolutely. Can you, yeah. can you tell me about a moment? Like, let's, let's make it real. Can you give me an example mm -hmm. of a time that you saw him sad? And can you tell me about, like, the conversation? Yeah, so for for Charlie, it was really a drawing in and like a shutting down of being just very quiet. And when I would see that, it would usually be if he saw, you know, another baby that was about the same age as our daughter would have been if she had lived or we were with, you know, some relatives or somebody else. It's It was that visible reminder 
that our daughter was no longer here and this is what she would be doing or this is what life would feel like or look like with her. And in those places, in those quiet times then at home, it was this place for him where he just kind of, you know, reverted into himself and was quiet. So, I mean, time sort of trickled on, right? This was this mm-hmm. was your first yeah. child. And then you went on yes. to have, have a family of three. Yeah. So it was about two years later that our daughter, Abigail, was born. And then we had a son, Bryce, a couple years after that and Carson a few years after that. And so to me, it was this place of, OK, I am living my dream. I'm a wife mm-hmm. and a mom. I was getting to to be this person that I had always wanted to be. And I think you know, I thought Charlie was in that same place with me, but he just wasn't, you know, he wasn't telling anybody about the thoughts that he was having or the things that were going on inside of him. I mean, I'm sure Mm -hmm. you get this question all the time. Did you ever get any indication that things were, were actually going badly for Charlie? I did not. You know, he was consistent at work. Um, He worked for my grandparents. He A lot of times he worked seven days a week, just depending on if somebody called off, he would pick up their shift. He, he was such a team player. What was he doing for work? Um, he was driving tractor trailer, hauling milk from these Amish farms to the dairy, you know, kind of mm. getting to live out his childhood dream. That's such a wholesome job. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there really wasn't anything from the outside looking in, you know, that would yeah. have given an illusion. I mean, I, I really just want to unpack that a little further because... I know the sort of the domestic reality of usually your your husband and wife, you get into bed at night and there's a bit of chat before you turn out the light. Um, And I'm just captivated by this idea that he never, he never showed his cards. He never said, hey, actually today I struggled or like you just catch him in a moment of quiet sadness or something. So he actually worked at nighttime. He, there were certain routes that had to be picked up at night um, based on whatever time the milk had to be delivered to the dairy. So he would leave around seven o'clock at night and he would get back maybe sometime around four or five in the morning. So he was coming home and getting a shower and crawling into bed about the time that I was getting up to get up with the kids. So he would sleep, you know, for the majority of the day. He'd be there through dinner and the early evening and I'd be getting the kids ready for bed and then he would go out on his route again. So we never really had those moments of that, just that one-on-one of the quiet and the stillness and that place to to share from the day. Yeah. I mean, I'm no psychologist, obviously, Mm -hmm. but it does feel to me like if you are working night shifts and then you sleep half the mm-hmm. day, you're spending the majority of your existence in isolation. That is yeah. Yeah. 16 hours a day where you're alone, for better or worse. And with in your, the dark. And in the dark. And I've yes. worked some night shifts and I know, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, I never got to a place where I'd say I was depressed, but I know the way it creeps up on you. I did notice if I did mm-hmm. three or four night shifts in a row, my view of the world became much darker. I was much more pessimistic. Mm-hmm. I was much more skeptical. I mean, I'm just wildly mm-hmm. speculating here, but I think being alone a lot, doing night shifts a lot, I would struggle mm-hmm. in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think everything feels worse at night. You know how it is if you're yeah. if you're worried about something and you wake up and you start thinking about it and you can't go back to sleep, it feels so much worse at night. Then you finally get a couple hours of sleep, you get up in the morning and you know, and you kind of talk to yourself and think, I don't know what that why I made that yeah. such a big deal at yeah, nighttime. Yeah. Things just feel so much worse at night. So I agree just the amount of time that he spent alone and especially in the dark. Um, you know, mm. in those if you're going into an Amish farm and their barn at night when it's dark, they don't have lights. You can't flip a light switch on. They don't have electricity. Oh, so, you know, he'd have a flashlight or something, but he really was in the dark for the majority of time that he was awake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That couldn't have helped. Right. Hey, we're just going to stop here for a quick ad break, but stick around. We'll be right back with more What It Was Like. Hey everyone, I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend John Calipari. I've been on the go recently, Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. 
Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, bit to get 30, bit to get 20, 20, 20, bit to get 20, 20, bit to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Okay, all right. So, so let's let's move to two thousand and six. What was happening in your life at that time? So, our kids were seven, five, and a year and a half, and mm. two of them went to school. The older two went to school every day. I was leading a prayer group for our, our local elementary school, and I did that on Mondays. So that Monday morning, it was beautiful. We here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we call it Indian summer, where, you know, mm. you can start to see the glimmer of fall and the leaves are just starting to change a little. So let's move to 2006. What was happening in your life at that time? So our kids were seven, five and a year and a half. And mm. two of them went to school. The older two went to school every day. I was leading a prayer group for our, our local elementary school, and I did that on Mondays. So that Monday morning, it was beautiful. We here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we call it Indian summer, where you know mm. you can start to see the glimmer of fall, and the leaves are just starting to change a little bit. But yet, it, it's still warm, and the windows were open, and we could hear the sound of harvesting from our Amish neighbors. You know, as they're cutting down their cornfields. And Charlie walked with us to the bus stop that morning. He kissed the kids before they got on the bus. And there was nothing that would have told you, oh, that's going to be the last time they saw their dad. But when I got home that day, it was around 11 or so. He wasn't there. And that surprised me. And it wasn't long until he called me and he said, Marie, I'm not coming home. And I remember the sound of his voice. It was like nothing that I'd ever heard before. It was flat and cold and lifeless. Let's let's slow this down. So you were in your house when you received this phone call. Yes. The two kids are at school, is that right? Mm -hmm. But your yes. youngest is asleep. Yeah, he was taking a nap. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then the phone rings. And when you mm -hmm. say that your husband's voice sounded off, can you give me some details on that? Like what was it that set off your alarms? You know, I think it's in those moments where you know something is terribly wrong. You know, if someone calls you and you can tell by the first word that they've said that something is terribly wrong, that's how I felt about that call. But, you know, even as he was talking, I was becoming concerned that he had planned to harm himself, but I had no idea that his plan was for anyone else, much less children. Okay. So so walk me through exactly what he said. He he said that he had something to do and something that he needed to take care of. And he just kept saying that he wasn't coming home. And I, I kept saying to him, you know, don't do this. Don't do whatever it is that you're planning. There has to be another way. There's always another way. But he wasn't listening to me. It was as if he wasn't even hearing me. Like he couldn't respond to the things that I was saying. And I, it felt like minutes. You know, it was one of those conversations that we were probably only on the phone for 15 or 30 seconds, but it felt like minutes and it felt like it was dragging on forever. But it, it was such a brief moment of that space of thinking to myself, I am never going to see him again. I don't know what's happening. I can't stop it. And I'm at a complete loss, you know, because up until that moment, my life felt good and normal. You know, I had when I got up that morning, I was a stay at home mom with three kids, you know, kind mm. of living out what I thought was my dream. And and here I am. It's not even noon. And suddenly I'm realizing that my whole world is changing. And, and I I wanted to stop it, but I I knew nothing. I couldn't stop it. Marie didn't know this, but about half an hour earlier. Charlie had pulled up his pickup truck outside a nearby Amish schoolhouse. He had a handgun and he ordered several boys to help him bring stuff from his truck into the classroom. And they started carrying in wooden boards, nails, and bags. Then 
Charlie ordered all the adults and the boys to leave. Then he got to work barricading himself and the remaining female students into the single-roomed schoolhouse with boards nailed over the front door. And look, it's basically unknown why he kicked out all the boys and, and chose the girls to remain. I mean, you know, all of his actions are basically incomprehensible, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe it had something to do with losing his own daughter to, to miscarriage. At about 20 to 11 a.m., the police showed up and they surrounded the school. Using a PA system, they asked him to surrender, but he remained barricaded inside with about 10 school kids. And it was about that time that he decided to call his wife. Marie didn't know any of this, but she was receiving that phone call from Charlie, who was standing in the schoolhouse, surrounded by police cars. Could you hear any noises in the background? Was there any indication about where I he was? I could not hear anything. No, it was completely silent where he was. He did tell me right before he hung up that he left a letter for me on the dresser and he said, tell our family that I love them. But, you know, the thing that stood out to me is that he didn't like he didn't say the kids names or he didn't say, tell my parents. He just said, tell our family that I love them. So I hung up the phone and I went to find that letter. And, you know, the thing about Charlie is that he wasn't a writer. Um, I enjoy writing. You know, if I'm going to write a card to somebody, I'm really going to think about it. I'm going to make sure that they feel loved and valued and that I see them in that card. And he always talked about the words that I would write and the way that I was so intentional but when when it was his turn to write a birthday card or something, you know, it was like two sentences. That just wasn't his thing. And and that mm. was fine. But that letter, it was several pages long. Mm. And that scared me because as I'm reading this letter, I'm thinking, you know, I've never seen a suicide note before, but this must be one. And in the letter, he talked about his anger at God and the brokenness that he carried over the loss of our first daughter in this place that he sort of held it against God. And for him, you know, the, what he was saying in the letter was that his actions, what he was doing that day was prompted out of that place of anger and bitterness. And so as I'm reading this letter, you know, again, I'm thinking, I still don't understand what it is that he's doing because he hadn't said anything specific in the letter. But I called 911 thinking, well, maybe something that doesn't make sense to me will make sense to them. Maybe they can help me stop this. But as soon as I started talking to that dispatcher, I knew that they knew far more than I did. And they weren't telling me what they knew. How did you know that? I could tell by the things they were saying. They weren't surprised when I talked about Charlie and I, they weren't surprised that I felt concerned that he was going to take his life. I could tell that they knew where he was. You know, they weren't asking me any questions about specifics of where do you think he is? You know, because in my head, I'm trying to think, where is he? You know, right. where could he possibly be? Because they knew. They knew where he was. They knew. Yeah. And and that conversation wasn't very long either. At the end, the dispatcher just said, you know, please stay home. If we need you, we'll call you back. And as I hung up the phone, I could hear the siren from our local fire department. And I could hear the police cars racing up the street. And there were helicopters flying overhead. Oh, and God. in that moment, it's the kind of thing that you want to think. There's no way that this is related. You know, this couldn't possibly be about the person that I love. But I knew in the pit of my stomach that this all had to be about Charlie. I feel like nothing suggests travesty like a helicopter. Yes. Yes. And, you know, the other thing was that I knew that if there's if there's that much support, you know, if there's a helicopter, if there's sirens, if there's police cars, this is not just about Charlie. And so for me, it was in that moment, the realization that this was more than him and just the the grief and the sorrow and the agony that you feel in that moment, knowing that not only could you not do anything to stop him from harming himself, but now this was certainly going to involve other people, you know, because you wouldn't need all of these things if it was just one person. And there was nothing in the letter that said, mm -mm. this is what I'm going to do or no. you know, nothing helpful. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, him talking about what a good mom I was and um, yeah, even just that he was able to say, Hey, he believed that we were, that I was going to have a better life without him. You know, it, 
the letter was a lot of things that didn't make sense to me. It was a lot mm -hmm. of him being angry, but there were also places where he was intentional about what he said to me. And the, you know, the acknowledgement of who he saw me to be and to mix all of those things together, you know, to mix the tragedy that was unfolding, the reality that I was going to be a single mom and a widow, the, you know, the magnitude of raising kids without their father, the scope of whatever it was that was unfolding. And yet there was this piece of this that he meant as a gift to me in talking about the life that he believed that I would have without him. Mm, God, that's such yeah. inside out, upside down thinking, isn't it? Yeah. It's really broken. Yeah, it was so many things that none of them belonged together. It, they belonged somewhere else. You know, they belonged in a in a birthday card, in a Christmas card or something, you know, where, where you're on a Mother's Day card. They didn't belong with this. Yeah. Do you do you still have that letter? I do. Yeah. You've never been tempted to throw it in a fire or, I don't know. No. Throw it out to sea? No. No. No, I mean, I like to keep, I keep letters. That's a thing for me. And I think for me, it was this place of, you know, sort of like, this is the last piece I have of something from him. Um, mm. I Not that there's a reason why you, you think you'd need it in the future, but to say, okay, this was the last thing that he left for me and I most certainly cannot get rid of it. Yeah. I mean, do you ever pull it out and look at it? Occasionally, Yeah. Yeah, once in a while I'll do that. And and I think to me, you know, part of part of my life has been it's not that I it's not that I tried to live this life that was good to prove that he was right, but it's this place to say you had no idea what you were giving up and what you were laying aside and that the way you chose to leave it didn't need to be that way. And you could have had this amazing life too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like like somehow remaining silent about his pain for all those years mm -hmm. was more important, that that was better than being mm -hmm. honest and vulnerable. And and that somehow like shooting up a, a schoolhouse was a better outcome than being vulnerable with his wife or with a psychologist. Right. Or Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, what happened yeah. after after you got off the phone to uh, the dispatcher? So it wasn't long until the police were in my driveway and I met them at the door and I said, it's Charlie, isn't it? And they said, yes. And I said, and he's dead, isn't he? And they said, yes. Because, you know, in, I don't know how many minutes it was between that phone call to the dispatcher and when they came. It didn't feel like much time at all. But, you know, I knew that he said he wasn't ever coming home. And so in that brief span of time between the, the phone call and the police showing up, I had prepared myself for the reality that he most likely was dead. The, you know, so I opened the door and I said to them, it's Charlie, isn't it? And they said, yes. And I said, he's dead, isn't he? And they said, yes. But then it was, they, you know, they came in and they talked to me about what he had done in the schoolhouse that day. And it was just shattering to me that, you know, this man who loved his kids could possibly be capable of doing what he had done. It, it just didn't make any sense. What the police told Marie was that Charlie had shot several girls aged between 6 and 13 before taking his own life. Later, there would be five dead and five survivors. And I won't go into the specific details of the shooting. If you want that kind of information, it's online. But I think what's important here for our story is glimpsing how Marie might have felt in that moment, on a couch, surrounded by police, and learning that her husband had chosen to go out in this tragic, nightmarish way. But, you know, I think a lot of times we hear about, um, you know, we have shock or we are in this place of denial or whatever. But for me, I, I didn't have the capacity for that because I was forced to deal directly with what Charlie had done. You know, they were asking me questions to see if I knew anything about it, which I did not. And, you know, they took our computer and they were going through our closets and, um, you know, 
clothing was kind of strewn everywhere. And uh, it this place of thinking, how on earth is this my life? Yeah, yeah, seriously. I mean, you've seen this moment in yeah. TV shows, and now it's mm-hmm. unfolding in yeah. your own living room. Did you Absolutely. know the police officers? I did not know. No. I did not okay. know them. Yeah. They were – so um, here in the States, we have, you know, state police. So we have our local police, and then we have state police. And so these were the state police. So if it would have been a local – a police officer maybe would have been somebody that I would have seen in passing throughout the years, but I didn't know yeah. any of these officers. So, you know, when they were done talking to me, uh, they one of the detectives stayed behind. He said, you know, you should prepare to leave your home for about a week because the media is coming. And he said that he would stay with me while I got some things together. And so I just was, you know, putting some things in wash baskets. I didn't have luggage. You know, we didn't travel a lot. And I went to my, I knew I was going to go to my parents' house. They lived not even a half mile away. I knew it wasn't really far enough, but it was the only place that I could think to go at that point. And so I was taking some things out to my car and I came back inside. And as I was walking through this living, in our living room, I knew that I had two choices. I could either choose to believe that our lives were over and we were going down like the fastest sinking ship. And I mean, that's what my circumstances looked like. Or I could choose to believe that God was everything that I had ever read in the Bible. And it wasn't that I, you know, was this giant of faith or something like that, but I knew that I had nothing. I was desperate. There was nothing I could do for myself or for my family. And so I made a choice that day to say, my life is not over. And, you know, when I look back at the things that I have learned along the landscape of my life, I've learned about the power of making a choice, you know, the power yeah. found in saying, I'm not going to let this thing define me. Yeah. I'm glad that you had that moment. Me too. Yeah. It, it probably made, you know, none of this is easy, but it probably made mm-hmm. it that much more just doable. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. What, um, can I ask how the, the police, you know, were they, mm-hmm nice to you? Was there, were they sympathetic or was there some sort of thinly veiled anger or how did they behave? No, um, they were nice to me. You know, I could tell that they, they felt bad that I was walking through this too. Um, you know, I cannot imagine what it was like for them to see the schoolhouse that day. I can't imagine what it was like for the Amish families, um, for the ones in the community who helped to take the schoolhouse down you know, I can't imagine the the aftermath for the first responders, you know, for all of the ambulance crews and the fire departments that were there that day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you never heard any gunshots or, or anything like that? I did not. No. We lived a couple miles from the schoolhouse, so I didn't, I didn't hear anything. Um, did you know that he had a gun? No. It, so his guns were locked in a safe at his parents' house. We did not have any, as far as I knew, we did not have any guns in our home. That was a major sticking point for me. Um, I didn't want guns in our home before we had kids, but certainly afterwards. And so any gun, you know, because he was a hunter, he hunted with his dad. Mm. And so it was my belief that any gun that he had was locked in his parents' um, safe. Okay. Yeah. And when you were sat down and and told what had happened, Mm -hmm. what, what was that, that sort of journey in your brain where you went, oh my God, this doesn't connect with what I know about my husband. Was it, was there any moments of like denial or or sense of like, no, they've got it wrong. It must be someone else. Or, you know, just talk to me about that brief journey. I, yeah, there it was so many places of wanting it to be wrong, of thinking there's no way that this could possibly be something that Charlie did, of how, you know, how is it possible that he could do these things? It's the kind of thing that you want to think that they had it wrong, but, you know, there was no way to deny that it was him. So mm-hmm. it it was this very weird thing. It felt like shocks. You know, if you think about, you know, an electrical shock going through your body, I, I think to me, the conversations with the detectives felt like electrical shocks over and over again in this place of how could this possibly be reality? You know, that you want mm. to think that it's all just a nightmare and you're going to wake up from it. Yeah, 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 I can imagine. Okay, yeah. so so what happened next? So, you know, that day... Um, 
it it felt like one of the longest days of my life. I remember being at my parents' home. That's where I told my kids about their dad, you know, and I gave it to them in very simple terms in the beginning. I just said, you know, today your dad made some very bad choices and some people got hurt and some people died and he died too. That's what you said verbatim. That was that. Yeah, yeah. that is pretty much exactly it. Um, you know, and and I knew that they had to know the whole thing, but I knew they didn't need to know it all at once at seven, five and 18 months, you know, just yeah. their ability to to process all of that. Um, so I unpacked it in more detail one on one throughout the week. But, you know, I, I remember sitting in my parents home and telling them that. And then in I remember standing at my parents kitchen window and kind of looking outside and thinking, how does this happen? You know, how did I wake up this morning with a completely different life? And here it is. And then mm. as I was having this conversation with myself, I look out the window and I see some Amish men coming down the street. And when I saw them coming down the street, I thought, I know that they're coming here. You know, I know that they're coming to my parents' house and I didn't know what to do. And so I went to my mom and dad and said, you know, I see these Amish men coming down the street. I know they're coming here. I don't know what to do about this. In my mm -hmm. mind, I'm thinking, you know, what kind of questions might they ask? What kind of, of demands might they make? And rightly so. You thought they were going to be angry. Yeah, yeah. It, like demanding answers because everybody had been looking to me to give them answers for Charlie's choices. And I really yeah. didn't have answers. I just had all these unanswerable questions. So when I saw them, that's what I thought. But my dad said to me, Marie, you can stay inside and I'll go out and talk with them. And so I stayed there at the kitchen window and I couldn't hear what they said but I saw, I saw the way that they put their hands on my dad's shoulder. And I saw the tears that flowed down all of their faces. And I saw the way that they embraced him before they walked away. Mm, and God. when he came inside, you know, we were waiting for him to collect himself from the emotion of that moment because, you know, you could see the emotion on him. And he said, Marie, they came because they were concerned about you and they were concerned about your kids. And they wanted you to know that they had forgiven Charlie and they were extending grace and compassion over your family. Oof. That's yeah. huge. I mean, this yes. was only a few hours after the atrocity. Yes. And your husband, Charlie, he'd gone and shot their daughters or granddaughters. Or, Granddaughters, you know, nieces. Yep. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. So... So I'm just trying to understand, you know, where where do you get the the human capacity for forgiveness and to to move so quickly from I would have been just like horrified, I would have been mm -hmm. just furious. Like furious yeah. as a word sure. doesn't even doesn't even slightly yeah. describe how I'd have felt. So right. to come to your house and, and offer forgiveness, I mean I'm like that's that's sort of superhuman forgiveness. Yeah. You know, to me it was that it was the evidence of everything that they said to my dad. Um, because a lot of times we can think these things, you know, and, and how admirable would it have been if they would have just chosen to forgive him and even in their thoughts to extend grace and compassion over our family. But it, that's not what they did. It was in that place of forgiveness and the grace and compassion that was prompted in their hearts that brought them then to this place of action where they couldn't just keep it to themselves. They felt compelled to share it and so they did okay what what were the so what were the following weeks like you know i like mm -hmm. on the one hand your husband's done this horrific thing but then on the other hand mm -hmm. you're now a single mother with three kids mm -hmm. yeah i think for me i wanted to give my you know kids the sense of normalcy and so i tried to keep all those things the same so mm -hmm. it was a lot of trying to find our rhythm of the new normal and to you know, regain some sense of feelings of control and life is the everyday while yet living in this reality that was absolutely not normal. Um, yeah. But there were so many, you know, beautiful moments. I would go down to our post office every day to get our mail and the postmaster would be waiting for me and he would give me this crate of mail because people from all around the world were sending me letters, you know, sending cards of encouragement. And most of them didn't even have my address on it. You know, it just said to the shooter's wife or something like that. And somehow the post office got it to me. But there, there were so many letters of encouragement and people just wanting us to know that they were thinking of us. It was really incredible. You know, I, I think 
in the, in the short term aftermath of that season, I remember thinking there are probably some really great books that I could read or something, but I don't have time to figure that out and and I don't have time to read them. But I felt like mm. every day those letters that I got, they were the healing that I needed. You know, yeah. they were the reminders that other people saw the pain in our lives and that we were not alone. Hey, we're just going to stop here for a quick ad break, but stick around. We'll be right back with more what it was like. Hi, this is Craig Robinson from Ways to Win. And support for this podcast comes from Invesco QQQ. The future isn't scary, not realizing its potential, however, could be. Just like on the recruiting trail, I've seen potential come in many forms as a coach. Learn more at Invesco.com slash QQQ. Let's rethink possibility. Invesco Distributors, Inc. I mean, the fact that you got all these letters also says mm-hmm. to me a lot about the, the scale of the media coverage that you were getting at mm-hmm. that time. If there were that many yeah. people hearing about the story all around the world, then, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm assuming you didn't turn on the TV much during that period. But, I did but not, no. Can you, give me, uh, yeah. can you give me a sense of what was happening? Um, the media was relentless. It, it was a very difficult season, uh, you know, where I would, if I left my house to go somewhere, there were many times that I was followed. It, I felt like I was living in something that you see in a movie that's never supposed to be your life. You know, one of the places where I really saw the extreme of that was at Charlie's funeral. Mm, Talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah. We had the ceremony at one church and then the burial at another church. And I had talked to the police detectives. You know, they said to me, don't worry, there won't be any media on the church property because I didn't want them looking on in this private moment of our grief. But we, we get to the church for the burial, and there's this lineup of reporters right across the street from the church, and they all had camera lenses that looked like telescopes to me. They were just huge. But as we all got out of our cars, you we could see something you know off to the side. And here it was a line of the Amish members from our community, and they were just walking single file, and they came and stood between us at the graveside and the road so that all the reporters could see were the backs of our Amish neighbors. <laughs> and you know, and one of the things you have to understand about the Amish is that they do not have their picture taken because they believe that it violates the Ten Commandments. So mm. they they would never want their picture taken, and yet they chose to put themselves in this spot. But when when the burial was over, they all lined up single file then to come and greet us. And my mom told me that the the very first woman that was leading this line, she was one of the moms who had lost a daughter in the schoolhouse that day. And so, you know, in the milliseconds that this is all happening, I'm thinking to myself, there is nothing that I could say to her that matters. I don't, I yeah. don't have words that yeah. can do anything. But as she came up to me, she held out her hand and I did too. And we just held onto each other's hands and looked one another in the eyes. And, you know, tears are both welling up in in our eyes. And I knew that I didn't have to say anything, that there was something about that moment in holding each other's hands and looking each other in the eye that we knew how the other one felt. and, And there was so much compassion from everyone on their side. Mm. Did you give yeah. a eulogy at the at the funeral? I I talked about Charlie very briefly. You know, I I said that I knew that he loved his family and that I knew that he struggled with his relationship with God and that in that moment what we had was each other. Um because as much as I knew that this was a hard moment for me, I also knew that it was hard for everybody in that room. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to talk about forgiveness and mm-hmm. some of the broader lessons from this experience. But I guess before I do that, I want to just reflect on on kind of what's happened here 
so that we're really clear on what we're forgiving. So, you know, he went into a, a schoolhouse and killed a whole bunch of young children. You know, that's that's pretty yes. unforgivable. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think also the, th- the thing that I find so shocking about it is how premeditated it was. You know, he had yeah. a plan. Yes. He had... Yes. He had like zip ties. He had mm-hmm. he had this gun. It like mm-hmm. there was so much planning that went into this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just just quickly, can you sort of tell me your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I have to keep myself out of that space because you know, what I've found in this experience, what I feel like I've learned from the Amish community is that forgiveness isn't about Charlie. And so it's not just saying, "Hey, I, I let this go. I'm okay with this. That's not what forgiveness is to me. It's a place of saying, if I want more than this, I have to choose to surrender all of these things that I feel and lay them down. Hmm. And I, I never hmm. want anyone to feel like I'm just saying, oh, just forgive and forget, you know, because hmm. it's not the way it works. I haven't forgotten anything, but I choose to say, that I'm not going to be defined by this. So you're suggesting that to, fu- to, to achieve forgiveness, you need to separate, like running through all the ways that you were let down in your mind doesn't service forgiveness. You need to sort of separate what happened with where you want to be. Yeah, yeah, because if I'm, you know, if, if I were to look at this and, and constantly remind myself, or if I were to say, Charlie, your choices have done this to me and they've done that to me and they've made this hard and they've caused this, caused this pain, where does that take me? You know, every choice mm. and every thought we have, it's like a step on a path of a road. Well, where's that road taking us? And if all it's, I'm doing is yeah. identifying the pain and my bitter and any kind of bitterness or anger, that's going to take me down a really dark path. But mm. if I'm able to say, you know what? I have forgiven Charlie and here's the good that I see out of this. Mm. That's going to take me down a completely different path. And that yeah. path is powerful. So yeah, I will always yeah. feel the pain of this in certain places. But if I'm looking, I can see extraordinary good because, you know, as ridiculous as it sounds, I love my life. I have a really beautiful life. Mm-hmm. I'm remarried. I have a wonderful husband, Dan. Uh, you know, he had two kids. I had three. We adopted our mm-hmm. youngest son from South Africa. I've gone on to college. I work with organizations and help them with their people. I speak. I write books. I have an extraordinary life, so much more than just being a wife and a mom. You know, I I kind of look back at Mm. that season and think, wow, I had no idea, you know, what I was capable of. And I think a lot of times we find some capability in seasons of hardship that we wouldn't have ever discovered otherwise. But I love the me that I get to be. And the reality is that I couldn't be this version had I not walked through pain. And I wouldn't yeah. have wanted that, you know? I wouldn't have wanted it for me, for my kids, for the Amish families. I wouldn't have wanted it for anybody. But I can't imagine not living this life. Yeah. Yeah. And just because I'm coming at this story as a curious and concerned Australian. Sure. Uh, yeah. We don't have guns in Australia. Guns are sort of yeah. this like mythical thing that you see on TV shows sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I read and see, observe the way that guns mm-hmm. are entrenched mm-hmm. in the culture there, I don't understand it. I find it fascinating, but also baffling. I want to get your thoughts on American gun culture as, I guess, a victim of that culture. Mm. You know, I, I think a lot of times whenever there's some kind of violent act, you know, where someone has used a gun, there's kind of that cry for gun control. And Mm. because guns are readily available in the United States, whether you get them by legal means or illegal methods, I think it's not about the gun control. It's about the people. Um, Mm. Because if somebody wants to do something, they're going to figure out how to do it, whether they got it legally or not. And so it's it's a people thing. You know, it's a heart thing. It's a, a a pain thing. But I think when we think about why America has such a problem with guns, I think it's really th- the root of any problem that you want to say exists in America. It's a people problem. It's it's a heart problem. It's, you know, what we're not owning um in mental health, whatever it is, being able to say, "Hey, this is where I need support and going after it." Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you've been asked this question before, but I'm curious. If Charlie walked mm -hmm. through the door right now as we're doing this interview, you know, what, what would you say to him? What would you do? You know, I probably, one, I would be stunned. And mm -hmm. I think I, I would want to say, you know, what were you thinking? I'm sure it wouldn't quite come out that nice. I probably would say, you know, like, what the hell were you thinking? I'm sure there would be a lot of That's emotion still and fairly passion. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure there would be a lot of emotion and passion behind it. I'm not generally mm. someone who who curses, you know. Mm. Um, no. So even saying that on your podcast makes me, you know, think, oh, I can't <laughs> believe I said that out loud. But and so um, we've we've had some yeah, cursing you before. Know, <laughs> I think it would be this place of just disbelief that he could choose the choices he chose, you know, um, mm. and. And wanting him to be able to to give a reason for that. I mean, I know what I I know what I know from what the psychologist says and all of that thing. But how can you let yourself get to that place where it's that bad that you decide mm -hmm. to make everyone else suffer instead of owning it and owning yeah. your responsibility to to do what you need to do to take care of you? Would you hug him? I don't think I would. Yeah, it'd be like seeing an no. ex-partner and it's all a bit awkward. And Yeah, I mean, I can still love him for the beautiful things that we created together. I mean, I love mm. my kids. There's nothing no. I wouldn't do for them, you know. No. But, but my, the renewal of my love or, you know, like the newness of that, it ended on the day that he died. And there isn't anything knew that I can love him for past that point because anything that I loved him for existed before that moment. And, and so for me, I don't think that I would be able to hug him um, because it, the love is past. It's not present and it exists um, because of our kids, but there would be such a place of, you know, own him needing to own his choices. Yeah. I mean, if you had to guess and you said, what the hell were you thinking? What, mm -hmm. what do you think he would say? I mean, I think he would say, I left it in the letter. You know, I okay. think he would reference the letter. Um, you know, he was pretty, he was a pretty quiet person. It's not that he didn't talk at all, but he, he wasn't, you know, someone who's just going to have a run on conversation with you for hours on end. Mm. Um, so I think he probably would just tell me I left it in the letter. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you if you want to know, you can just read the letter again, even though mm -hmm. I guess to you the letter felt fairly confusing or fairly yeah. confused. Well, yeah. And and it wasn't anything that talked about, you know, when when was he doing all of all of the like pre made meditated acts and collecting the things that he took with him to the schoolhouse that day? You know, I I would want to know how did you do all those things? Where did all of this happen? Mm. You know, all of that stuff that that's not, there's none of that that's in the letter. The letter's all, you know, kind of like the, the abstract. There's nothing concrete about that letter. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, and I think that's an important point is, mm -hmm. is, I mean, when I look, when I think about it and I boil this down, it feels to me like he did this. It, it was a message. It, it wasn't really. Mm -hmm. There was no anger directed at any individuals in that schoolhouse. No. It was. No. It was just. It was like, here is. Uh, here is a snapshot of how angry I am at the world. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Look what you've made me do. That mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm. I guess I'm simply saying that I. I find that just hard to wrap my head around. I mm -hmm. just you know. What, what a waste. What a waste just for a stupid yeah. message. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and to me, that's sort of the point of living a life that's beautiful and that's worth loving mm. because he chose to not be a part of that and to yeah. say, you didn't have to make this choice. You could have figured out a way and created a life that you loved and gotten the help and the support that you needed to make it through. This 
this was never on the table. You know, this shouldn't ever have been something that was even in your realm of possibilities. You could have had all of this and you you gave it away. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. How yeah. do you how do your kids uh process that these days? I mean, I'm guessing this, you know, there's adults now. How how do they mm-hmm. live with this? I mean, one of the one of the really beautiful things that I've seen with my kids is just their capacity to see brokenness in their peers. Um and and just that reciprocated place then of classmates kind of coming to them and saying, "Hey, can I talk to you? I know you'll understand what's going on in my life because you've gone through this whole thing in your life. Um, so I see the, you know, the beautiful aspect of the vulnerability that it's prompted in other people recognizing that they can share difficult truths and stories with my kids. But, you know, I think it really is this hard place to, to create some kind of identity for yourself mm. that isn't about your parent or their story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess... I'm I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes. I think it's particularly hard if you share genetic code, you know, like yeah. this this guy mm-hmm. who did this is their father. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm I'm wondering have any of them struggled with this idea about like I'm part of that lineage, you know, this is part mm-hmm. of me as well. Yeah, for me, you know, it was kind of a place of saying, "Hey, I want you to talk to a therapist. You know, I want you to yeah. to have that connection, especially as you become a young adult, to be able to process those things. Because as much as I can tell them, hey, that's not who you are, or look at all these things that are so good about who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So so this happened in 2006, and you published your yeah. book in 2013. You stayed pretty quiet on this for a long time. Yeah. And then, you, and then you started talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, why have you gone public? You know, you've got a podcast. You're talking mm-hmm. to me. What What is it yeah. that you want to achieve? So, you know, I think the thing that I know is that we all go through places of pain. You know, we all have brokenness. We all have a story. If I was just looking at the story from the outside, I would think, oh, she probably, you know, has a terrible life and there's nothing good that's happened to her or whatever. But have a really good and beautiful life. And it's because I decided that these circumstances weren't going to be the definition of my life. And and so for me, that is the place of sharing my story. It's to say, you know, we need those reminders. In our places of pain, we need the reminder that there's more. And and I can be that reminder because I've walked through such a hard road. You know, if my life can turn around like this, what is in store for you? In, in your place of pain, you just have to choose to not give up and settle in that moment. Um, and so for me, it's really sharing the healing and the hope that I found, you know, the, the beautiful way that life has become so much more rich and meaningful and purposeful, and then the opportunity to help other people find that as well. Mary, I think that's a beautiful and really important message. I think that's great. Thank you. Thanks. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your story with me. And absolutely, and it was a privilege. If you're interested, you can learn more about Marie at her website, www.mariemonville.com, and you can also find her podcast called "To Help You Heal" on your favorite platform. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Tuffery. It was mixed by Nicholas Feliciano. Evie Atkins is our intern. Jimmy Saunders did our theme music. Our cover art is by Naomi Lee Beveridge. And this whole thing has been a super real production.